Welcome to the channel. Today, we're diving into the fascinating story of the Horton Flying Wing Germany's jet-powered UFO. More than any other contemporary air service, the German Luftwaffe during World War II explored the outer limits of aircraft design. They didn't have much choice. The Luftwaffe introduced not just the first jet fighter into operational service, the Mi-162, but also the first and only rocket interceptor ever used in combat, the Mi-163 Comet. They also explored radical point defense fighters that would have used VTOL capability, though none were completed before the end of the war. Facing the combined industrial might of the United States and the Soviet Union, Germany simply could not produce conventional aircraft in sufficient numbers to effectively fight the Allied Air Forces. Instead, they looked to new technology to give their aircraft a performance edge that would overcome the deficit in numbers. But perhaps no Luftwaffe project of World War II was more futuristic than that which led to a jet-powered flying wing fighter, bomber. Even more surprising, this aircraft was designed and created by two brothers with little formal engineering training. This is the story of the Horton brothers, their flying wings, and the astounding Ho-229. Origin the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I essentially banned Germany from developing military aircraft and having an air force. Because of this, many German aircraft designers turned either to civil aircraft or to the design of gliders which were permitted under the treaty. In the 1920s and 1930s, German gliders became some of the most advanced in the world and German pilots held most of the top gliding records. The German brothers, Reimar and Walter Horton, became enthusiastic members of a gliding club in the late 1920s and spent time in the heart of the German gliding scene, the Wassercup Mountain. However, the brothers weren't content simply to fly the gliders they found there. They also began to design and build their own radical new designs. Though neither had any formal aviation or engineering training, inspired by the designs of another German designer, Alexander Lippisch, who produced several tail-less Delva gliders. The Horton brothers explored the concept of a flying wing design. Their first gliders were simply vast wings with no conventional tail and in several early models. The pilot lay prone to improve streamlining. These first gliders weren't easy to fly, but they did have very good performance. One of the advantages of the flying wing approach is the very low parasitic drag created by the airframe. That is ideal in a glider. But it wasn't long before the Horton brothers began to wonder if this approach might not also provide performance advantages in a powered aircraft. Due to their lack of technical qualifications, the Hortons were largely ignored by most large German aircraft companies. Being regarded as little more than enthusiastic amateurs was some rather odd ideas of aircraft design. However, both were members of the Nazi party and that gave them distinct advantages in making the right contacts after the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933. The first powered Horton aircraft, the Hortonva, began construction in 1936. The Hortons were supported in this build by Dynamit Ag, who were experimenting with new synthetic materials. This aircraft was once again a flying wing design, with a mostly wooden structure covered in an early plastic trolitax. The front center section of the wing was glazed, with another synthetic material, transparent selen. In the cockpit, the two crew members sat side by side at the leading edge of the wing. Power was provided by a pair of tiny Hearth HM60 or engines driving a pair of two-bladed propellers in the trailing edge of the wing. On its maiden flight, with Rymar and Walter at the controls, the Vic crashed immediately after takeoff. Fortunately, neither brother was seriously injured and soon after another prototype, the VB was completed. This version used a more conventional wood and metal construction and the novel wingtip controls used by the V were abandoned in favor of conventional elevons. The hearth engines were salvaged from the V and reused. Though in the VB, they were mounted further forward and drove propellers through extended shafts. This improved weight distribution. Thought to be the cause of the crash of the V and the VB made a number of short flights in 1937 and 1938. However, 
there was little official interest in the flying wing concept. The Luftwaffe was taking delivery of a new fighter, the Messerschmitt Bf 109, which was as good or better than any other single-seat fighter than in service anywhere in the world and there seemed little need to further explore such a radical concept. Rymar and Walter Horton abandoned their design work. The VB was left to decay and the brothers joined the Luftwaffe and trained as fighter pilots. Walter Horton flew the BF-109 during the Battle of Britain. Before becoming the technical department head of Luftwaffe Inspection 3, Luftwaffe Inspectorate for Fighters, in 1941, he was able to persuade his superiors that it was time to revisit the flying wing concept. A new detachment was created in Minden to build a new version of the Horton V. In charge of this detachment was Rymar Horton, who had also qualified as a fighter pilot before being posted to the Luftwaffe gliding section. Did the Horton flying wing ever fly? Yes, the Horton flying wing, specifically the Horton Ho 129, did indeed fly back in 1943. This all-wing and jet-propelled aircraft promised remarkable performance. The head of the German Air Force, Hermann Göring, recognized the possibilities of a new aircraft. He gave half a million Reich marks to the inventors for constructing and trying out various models. Despite facing many technical issues and the sole-powered model meeting an accident, after a few trials, it still stands out as one of the most unique fighter planes examined during the Second World War. The Ho-2-9, under the direction of the new detachment, to Horton-powered flying wing aircraft were completed at Minden. The VC was an improved version of the VB, though the only example was lost after a crash in the summer of 1943. The 7 was originally envisaged as a flying test bed for the Argus Pulse jet engine, but slow progress on that project meant that it was instead powered by two Argus SBC engines. Driving a pair of two-bladed pusher propellers mounted on extension shafts. In flight tests, the 7 performed satisfactorily. Though its tiny engines meant that it was painfully slow, there was some discussion of using this aircraft as a trainer for fighter pilots. But in truth, no one could see a military role for the 7. That might have been the end of the Horton flying wing story, but it was shown to the head of the Luftwaffe. Hermann Goring. He was sufficiently impressed that he ordered 20 examples to be built, though none would be completed before the end of the war. He also provided funds and encouragement for the Horton brothers to explore something much more radical, combining their flying wing design with the then new jet engines to create a fighter. Bomber capable of meeting the 3-1000 requirement raised in 1943. This called for an aircraft capable of carrying 1,000 kilograms of bombs over a range of 1,000 kilometers and at a speed of 1,000 kilometers per hour. The Horton HIX, which was given the RLM designation HOD 129, was to be a single seat, flying wing powered by the turbojet engines. Initial design work suggested that it was the only aircraft potentially capable of meeting the three times 1,000 requirement and that it might also be able to operate at altitudes of up to 45,000 feet. An order was immediately placed for the construction of three prototypes. The new aircraft was to be a flying wing with a conventional single-seat cockpit in the front of the fuselage center section, in addition to its ability to carry up to 1,000 kilograms of bombs. Our LM also demanded that it be armed with a pair of 30 millimeters cannons. If the performance predicted by the Hortons proved to be accurate, it was believed that this aircraft might also make a formidable fighter. The center section was made from welded steel tubing while the wing spars were wood. The whole aircraft was covered in a skin formed from thin sheets of plywood. To speed up construction, many pre-existing components were reused. The triscal undercarriage was created by using the tail wheel from a Heinkel He 177 bomber as the nose wheel and undercarriage legs from ABF-109 fighter for the main gear. The pilot was provided with an early ejector seat and would wear a pressure suit. This would enable flight at high altitudes without the complexity of a pressurized pilot compartment. The engines originally envisaged were BMW 003 turbojets, 
but delays in the development of this engine led to a switch to the Jumo 00 for turbojet, also using the Messerschmitt Mi 160 to fighter, and Arado R230 for bomber. The Jumo engines were larger than the BMW, which involved the redesign of the center section of the Ho 229, an unpowered version. The Ho 229 V1 was completed and successfully flown, proving that at least the new design was capable of flight. On February 2, 1945, the powered Ho 129 V2 was finally rolled out for its first flight. It was piloted by Lieutenant Erwin Ziller, and the first flight, lasting just 30 minutes, seemed to go well. The following day, Zimmer flew the Ho 229 again, but as he approached for landing, he inadvertently deployed the drogue parachute, causing a very heavy landing that damaged the aircraft. This was repaired and on the 18th of February, Ziller took the Ho 229 on its third flight. After 45 minutes in the air, he approached the field but lost control and the aircraft crashed into the ground, completely destroying the prototype and killing the pilot. Despite this, work on the Ho 229 continued. Gadhar Wagon Fabric was commissioned to build a third prototype and to prepare this aircraft for mass production. This project received priority when it was included in the Juggernaut Program Emergency Fighter Program, introduced in the summer of 1944 to accelerate the production of advanced technology weapons. However, no example of what was designated the GO-129 to was ever completed before the war ended. The incomplete V-3 prototype was captured by U.S. forces when they occupied the GO-TO works and is currently on display at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Even before the sole flying, powered HO-129 prototype was lost in February 1945. The Horton brothers had already begun work on an even more ambitious design, the Horton HXVIII, an intercontinental flying wing bomber powered by four or six jet engines that might have been capable of bombing targets in North America. Fortunately, the war came to an end before this new project moved beyond the design stage. Conclusion The HO-229 was a notable example of the Luftwaffe's adoption of advanced technology in World War II. It was the first turbojet powered flying wing ever created and the few test flights completed seem. Data suggests that it would have had a satisfactory performance. However, like many Luftwaffe Wonderwaffe Wonder weapons, it was too little and too late to make any difference to the war. One issue that is often raised in relation to this aircraft is whether it might have been stealthy. That is, difficult or impossible to detect on the radar. There is simply no evidence to suggest that this was considered during the design process. Though the hold to 29's wooden skin and a lack of sharp edges would probably have given it an unusually small radar cross-section. In that sense, the Ho-129 can certainly be seen as a forerunner of the F-117 stealth fighter or even of the flying wing beat a stealth bomber. After the war, Reimar Horton remained in Germany and became an officer in the post-war Luftwaffe. Walter emigrated to Argentina, where he continued to design tailless aircraft. One of those was the FMAI.38 Naranjiro Orange Tree, an extraordinary flying wing powered by four piston engines and designed as a high-speed cargo aircraft that would be used to rapidly transport oranges to Buenos Aires. The only prototype made a few short flights in the early 1960s before the project was abandoned, effectively bringing to an end the story of Horton flying wings.